that I was born, and the destiny for which I have bled, and tortured, and killed, and died, again and again. Now rest yourselves. Lights out! One of the most perplexing things in our deep and rich history of Call of Duty Zombies is the tale of the controversial map Blood of the Dead and the rippling effect that it had on the community at large. Blood of the Dead was doomed to fail from the very beginning, but why? And how could something fail before players even laid their eyes on it? You see, this wasn't the first time where Treyarch had brought back remade or remastered content into a zombies mode, as you can see the first glimpses of this from the glory days of Black Ops 1. But every time a fan favorite map returned, the community was largely enthused. You're asking, are you going to see on well, remastered maps? Kind of like Zombie Chronicles 2.0. Well, is there, is there any interest for that? Yeah. yeah. Zombies Chronicles was the ultimate example of this, remastering eight classic maps on the immensely popular Black Ops 3 engine. However, even with Chronicles' immense success, fans kept asking about the remaining maps, in particular, Mob of the Dead. You'd think a recreation of Mob with the latest COD engine should be an easy win, but bringing a project of this magnitude to life is rarely ever so simple. And in the case of Blood of the Dead, there was a disconnect between developers and the fanbase. And the reason behind this disconnect Connect was because Treyarch failed to answer the most important question regarding a map of this caliber. Did it even need to exist? Personally, I love Black Ops 4 Zombies, and I still think that it has its issues, just as any Zombies mode does. And I do believe that some of these issues actually contributed to the first real blow that the Zombies community has ever really felt. And just like many of the other controversial maps from COD Zombies, this is no different in terms of the residual impact left behind. But after all of this time, have feelings towards this map changed at all? Was the vitriol justified? Well, the answer to these questions is much more nuanced than you might expect, which is why we are going to be taking a look at the past as well as the present for a real explanation. So strap in, ladies and gentlemen, as we're about to fast travel through hell and back, this is Blood of the Dead. After waiting over two years to experience our final chapters with Richtofen, Dempsey, Takeo, and Nikolai, fans were chomping at the bit to unearth the secrets Treyarch had left for us to find. And as the curtain of information began to slowly peel back, the levels of hype naturally began to rise. And eventually, in early 2018, Treyarch debuted their next offering at one of the largest reveal events in Black Ops history. This momentous occasion was meant to highlight all of Black Ops 4's amazing game modes, including Zombie claiming that our beloved third mode was no longer an afterthought and would be the biggest and best zombies rendition of all time. We've already said that Black Ops 4 is the deepest, most replayable game in our history. So it's my great pleasure to reveal that for the first time ever, we will launch with three fully fledged, fully loaded zombies experiences on day one. The event was a huge success and you could see the electricity in the air. I actually remember getting chills watching the former Zombies director, Jason Blundell, leaving the stage with two blood vials pinned to his backside. And this was the moment that Blood of the Dead was finally revealed to the public. One of our all time fan favorite maps told the story of four lost souls trapped in an eternal purgatory Desperate to break the cycle. Here is a small peek of Black Ops 4's third Zombies map. The Black Ops 4 lineup was stacked 
multiple zombies experiences, storylines, crews, easter egg, and all of this promised to be supported with consistent updates surpassing the traditional one year lifespan. It was clear Treyarch were going all in. As for the community, this sounded like a dream come true. However, with this much content coming down the pipeline, it was inevitable that sacrifices were going to be made somewhere, and later during Black Ops 4's life cycle, fans would find out how true that would be. Treyarch Studios, love them or hate them, is known for their innovation to the Call of Duty series. And with Zombies, they're known to take things even farther. And after the stellar season that was Black Ops 3 Zombies and Zombies Chronicles, Treyarch had unintentionally set the bar way out of reach. This track record is largely associated with Jason Blundell, whose burning passion for this mode has brought to light some of the greatest maps arguably of all time, Mob of the Dead being one of them. He also brought about one of the most important narrative shifts inside of COD Zombies that elevated the franchise to something more than just slaying the undead. This narrative, also known as the Ether storyline, was approaching its 10-year anniversary, which made Treyarch's reimagining for Blood of the Dead that much more significant. So why am I bringing all of this up? Well, weeks leading up to launch, Jason would be completing interviews for the game's marketing campaign where he would be mentioning things other than the Ether storyline. The chaos story. And the chaos story. Chaos and chaos. Chaos story. Now, I'm not knocking the guy, nor am I saying that Treyarch wasn't putting their all toward the conclusion of Ether. But when things blatantly transitioned to all chaos all the time, fans couldn't help but become a little nervous. The issue was that this new story would take resources away from something that we have been waiting 10 years to resolve. And while the launch maps weren't really affected by poor resource management, the lack of funding and number of developers working on zombies depleted during the DLC season, which we will talk about in later videos. This is arguably the most crucial reason as to why fans still have a bad taste in their mouth when it comes to Black Ops 4 zombies. What's even more interesting, and I would argue adds more fuel to this fire, is that Mob of the Dead deserved a remake. And I mean, it's no secret that fans wanted it, which is likely why Treyarch succumbed to our demands and created it. Its successor. But with a situation this delicate, Treyarch needed to handle the execution of this map perfectly, which begs the question, did they stick the landing? When Blood of the Dead finally launched, the reception from fans was generally mixed for a variety of reasons. Most people really loved the art direction and were very enthusiastic about the story, but when it came to the gameplay, main quest, and stability, let's just say Treyarch failed to deliver. How? This is the, the, the key to- Can't not, not get hit. No, look, I can't, I'm not doing anything. I'm, you can't outscape them. What's that drop? Oh, no. Bye, bye, bye. 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 Field's gone. I'm dead. I, I, I fucking, I hate this, actually. I'm dead because of a dog. No, 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 no. Okay. Are you kidding me? Are you effing kidding me? What kind of garbage is that? This zombies experience was plagued by crashes, enemy imbalance, and completely bugged Easter egg steps. It seemed like all of Treyarch's hard work was getting flushed down the toilet in real time as people were prevented from appreciating all of the hard work that the devs put into it. We released with uh, three maps that we're incredibly mm -hmm. proud with, but um, it's also no secret that we, we, we had a bit of a bumpy start as yeah. well. And while this issue wasn't only haunting Blood of the Dead, it mostly impacted it as well as its reception. It also didn't help that Treyarch had exuded a severe amount of hype on Blood and the community had high expectations of Treyarch, not only because this was a mob reimagining, but because of the success of Zombies Chronicles as well. And while Treyarch may have stopped short of the finish line back in 2018, a lot of time has passed, which makes me wonder if feelings have changed for the better. Arguably one of the most significant elements of any Zombies map is its atmosphere, as this sets the tone for what the player is preparing to experience. And if there is one area that Blood of the Dead excels in, it's style. Art direction is one of those things that is overlooked very frequently from gamers, and while graphics and atmosphere are nothing without their gameplay, I believe that it's really important to remember that we are going to be spending many hours inside of this map. 
And if developers can create an engaging, beautiful world to explore, the level of immersion for the player will inevitably increase. A perfect example of this is in the first moments of Blood of the Dead when you are spawning into the map. Most of the time, we just start running around and killing what's ever in front of us. But next time you spawn into a zombies map, really pay attention as this is its defining moment. Starting off in Richtofen's lab, you're surrounded by mysterious equipment that he's using for reasons that we don't understand yet. And all of the items in the room also have a narrative baked into them. Whether it's the cryo chambers with the Victus crew or the walnut on the mini teleporter pad, all of this sets the stage to intrigue the player, getting the wheels turning as to what secrets this prison holds. Making our way up to the surface, we realize we are on a whole new side of the island that we have never experienced before. And that's when we see two new areas appear, the power station and the new industries building. These new locations are surrounded by broken pathways with lava and fire permeating from the surface, making sure that we know that we are in hell. The other addition here is the catwalk, which is one of the most epic introductions to a zombies map that we have ever received before. Generally, Treyarch has a standard progression that they implement while we make our way through the zombies map at a slow pace that lets us become more powerful as the rounds increase in difficulty. But not here. This was different. Just take a look. Sam, just a short stroll to the main cell Pop, pop. Treyarch knew that when we entered this catwalk, we would be entering a bottleneck with zombies running at us at full speed. They knew we would have no perks, no shield, and no pack-a-punched weapons. They wanted to throw everything they had at us right in the early moments of the game so that you better be ready. Treyarch also could have just put something like this in the intro cutscene, but instead we received cinematic storytelling through gameplay, making this such a powerful way to portray this broken world. The last new area that was added is the Warden's House, which while not my favorite addition, acts as a hub for the main quest. The main issue with it is that it's so far out of the way and quite frankly a death trap, so you have to be very careful when you're entering. To say that Blood of the Dead is simply a carbon copy of Mob is not exactly true. Blood of the Dead feels like its own map while also feeling very similar, almost like a sense of deja vu. However, even while containing a lot of Mob of the Dead's greatest hits, there is one area that is missing which is definitely a downgrade. The Golden Gate Bridge. I'm not sure why Treyarch decided to remove this iconic area of the map, or maybe it was just an oversight, but this is definitely a negative in my mind as it's one of the most iconic features inside of Mob of the Dead. Overall, Blood of the Dead's art direction and graphical fidelity, especially on PC, is truly something special as you can really feel that loneliness and the despair looming in the atmosphere. And it's not just from visuals alone, but from how they are organized, how things sound, and how your mind fills in the gaps to exude those deeply uncomfortable emotions. Alcatraz isn't an ordinary prison. It breaks down its prisoners slowly by encapsulating them in a purgatorial loop in an attempt to break their soul. Which is why this is a story about sacrifice. It's a story about sorrow. It's a story about conflict and the duality of the human condition. Whether it's the warden trying to find solace in his deal with the devil, or it's Richtofen trying to break the cycle to save his friends in the universe, there is always something deeper than what floats upon the surface. As many of you already know, Blood of the Dead takes place in between Setsubo Noshima and Gorod Krovi during the events of the Black Ops 3 cycle. The cycle itself is the repetition of going from origins through revelations continuously forever. Richtofen is the only one who is aware of this, and that's because he is the one more or less causing it. And since Richtofen has traveled through many multiverses over time, his blood has filled with the ether and can be extracted to open a gateway. While Primus has arrived at Alcatraz hundreds of times, this time the Cronorium has changed, allowing Brutus's prophecy to become fulfilled, and now he is trying to acquire Richtofen's blood by capturing him in his dark mechanism, which is what led to this masterful moment in our intro cutscene. We need this. The Cronori. But I've already read it. Read it again. What is the meaning of this? The pages have changed. They our blood. Mine blood. You cannot possibly expect me to let this happen. You son of a bitch! Now trapped with zombies surrounding them, Primus must figure out how to escape before it's too late, which is now where the player comes in. 
As we have already established, on launch, this quest was a broken, buggy mess. But after five years have passed, the newly found quest steps and improved stability have given Blood of the Dead a breath of fresh air. At this point in time, anyone and everyone can complete this egg, no questions asked, and will have a fully polished experience from start to finish. Playing this Easter egg in 2023 is truly a joy if you understand how to uproot all of its secrets. The level of optimization in Blood of the Dead is not quite on par with maps like Origins or Shadows of Evil, but there are many aspects that allow us to have a heavy advantage. The main issue with the quest is simply the order of operations and how eventually the player hits a wall when the challenge portion takes center stage. But to be completely fair, the quest isn't nearly as complicated as it seems when you break it down in its most basic form. Firstly, while this quest isn't perfect, as there are some annoyances like constantly looking at everything through your shield, the setup portion is entirely optimized and can be completed in such early rounds without any pay to win elixirs. So let's talk about it. Simply by knifing only and using the catwalk strategy, we can have almost the whole map open with the shield built by round one. This will put us miles ahead, giving tons of room for error as the round counter ticks up. And if we continue this trend while feeding the hellhounds, we can acquire both the hell's retriever and the spork by round four or five. If we only kill zombies when absolutely necessary, it is possible to begin starting challenges before you hit the teens. This is important to note because shortly after the release of this map, fans were upset about how many rounds it took to get Brutus's office open. The reason behind this controversy was that we needed Brutus to break down the wall to his office with his EMP attack, which would only occur after round 16. This meant not being able to initiate the challenge sequence until round 20 or higher. This made things incredibly difficult for solo players as some of these challenges aren't exactly made for one person. But you see, we were actually totally wrong about how this step worked. If we head over to CD Street and look just beneath this grate, we can see a little monkey statue. Then as we kill zombies with a level 2 specialist weapon, collect their souls, and shoot the monkey when it turns red, we can head to the lab to pick up our free monkey bomb. After that, we make our way to the electric number pad at the bottom of the ramp to spawn in a Brutus by typing in the numbers 666. We lead Brutus back to his house, throw down a monkey bomb near the wall, and Brutus will slam it using his EMP attack. This will give us access to the room room on a much lower round than usual. This is one of those instances where map knowledge rewards the player and allows us to get things done a lot quicker. No wasting time, no wasting rounds, just pure Easter egg optimization. I love it. And while this may take a few tries to get used to, the whole experience is super cinematic and flows excellently. But this next part is where things lose momentum. Well, sort of. Let me explain. The second half of the main quest, or as I call it, the challenge portion, is not as bad as I remember from 2018, but it isn't designed nearly as well as something like Dreisendrak, Origins, or Ancient Evil. And I have been thinking about this step for a while now, as well as its design, and I think I finally understand why it's so problematic. Firstly, the connective tissue between getting set up and beginning the challenges is quite frankly a mess. I don't know who came up with this idea, but it will go down as one of the worst steps in zombies history, and that is the bird step. This is the part of the Easter egg where the seagull steals the cronorium from us and we have to find the bird and steal it back. However, since it's a bird, he can literally be anywhere on the map in over 40 locations, and your only cue on how to find him is by the sound of him chirping. Hey, little bird. I'm the nice doctor. Now, normally, annoying steps are sprinkled in here and there. And while this is sort of par for the course in COD Zombies, this bird step in particular is one of the worst. What makes this alleged assault on the player base indefensible is that it makes us waste our time. Four rounds, in fact, which is another reason why I think people shy away from completing this egg. The second thing that I think is a misstep is the fact that the challenges are not able to be completed in a controlled method by the player. In a map like Origins, there are many steps to complete. Complete, and as a community, we kind of arbitrarily selected an order of operations because it makes sense to have steps in some sort of logical order for people to complete. But here's the thing, some of those steps can be completed in any order that you want. For example, the four chests located around the map that reward us with the one inch punch can be filled at any point in time. It just kind of makes more sense to wait to do it towards the end, but we are in control. With Blood of the Dead, we don't get a choice to order these challenges, so there is no inherent advantage. 
And I think when the RNG is this blinding, it's frankly just bad game design as it's withholding information from the player. These steps are all so drastically different and are completed in a very specific section of the map, which can bring things to a screeching halt if you don't know what you're doing or how to prepare. So the first challenge, in no particular order, is located on Michigan Avenue. This is an escort challenge where we are to protect a prisoner's spirit while he is making his way around the map. This is one of the more fun missions as it requires a bit of skill and planning. Zombies start sprinting in attacking both the player and the spirit, and eventually Brutus makes an appearance as if things weren't chaotic already. However, if we have the Magma Gat and a full specialist charge, things should generally be in our favor. The Showers or the Banjo Challenge is another fan favorite, mostly due to the fact that it's also very simple to execute and doesn't waste time with puzzles. In order to complete this, we need to remain stationary inside of these blue lit circles and collect zombie souls. Once the threshold is met, the banjo will be in tune and our singer-songwriter will take his five string back and be on his way. These next three challenges are often perceived as annoying by the community, and while I do think this is partially correct, I also think that there is a lot of misinformation surrounding them. The docs challenge or the Morse code challenge for years was assumed to just be based on random nothingness and people would stand by the input for minutes at a time, entering dots and dashes until they heard the completion cue. But of course, there was a way to solve this thing the whole time and we just missed it. There are three buoys outside of the map in the water that actually blink the right code, only if you look at them through the shield, of course. There is one outside of the gondola, one outside of the catwalk, and one outside of the spawn window. It's literally that simple. After this, we head to the infirmary where we complete a hybrid escort kind of soul box challenge as we navigate a spirit to the docks, but he can only move from us getting kills. So now that the Morse code step can be completed correctly, that means three of the challenges are actually pretty easy and we only have two to worry about. So the last two steps, they take place on the other side of the island where we spawn in. One is in the new industries building and one is inside of the power station. For the power station challenge, we play a game of Simon Says down by the second power switch near the docks. The best way to complete the Simon Says game is to have Winter's Whale on as a perk, save one or two zombies and let the zombies hit you in between segments of the game. Once we have our symbols memorized from the generators, we can grab the punch card and head back to the spawn for the final translation. Once we have our three new symbols, the final step is to shield blast that spirit in front of the correlating symbol in the power station so that he will pull the correct levers. This step is more tedious than anything and it may sound difficult as I explain it, but once you've done it once or twice, it's really not that complicated. Where things really take a wrong turn is with the new industries challenge, aka the shield suck challenge. This is the worst challenge by far, especially for solo players, unless you have the undead man walking elixir, which we will discuss in just a moment. The way that this process works is that we have to prevent a spirit from making his way from the prison to the new industries building by sucking him with the soul key. <clears throat> We have to shield blast him three times and kill him inside of the blade trap. On co-op, this isn't nearly as bad, since one person's job can be to lure the zombies away, or at least to kill them. But on solo, it's a nightmare. I am sure there are ways to combat this effectively, but I am definitely not skilled enough. The best way to do this, I have found at least, is to use the undead man walking elixir as I alluded to before. The issue is, this elixir isn't free, and any step in zombies that cannot be completed without a pay to win mechanic is totally unfair, as the chance of earning decent elixirs in BO4 is not very high statistically, worse than BO3 by far. That being said, out of this whole easter egg, the only two terrible aspects of it are the Cranorium or the Bird Step and the New Industries Challenge. Everything else is really well done, and when you start to understand the ins and outs of the map, your experience becomes very streamlined and enjoyable. And after completing all of the challenges, this is when things really ramp up, as we head back to the Warden's office and are officially confronted by him. This is where we learn that this was in fact the warden's plan the whole time, and the key to what he needs lies within Richthofen's veins, hence the name Blood of the Dead.
Fortunately, the seagull from earlier who stole the Cronorium frees us as he is none other than Al Arlington from Mob of the Dead. Once we are freed, we grab our belongings and make our way through the catwalk and aggressively get attacked by hellhounds. We confront Brutus one last time and he is lifted away by spirits in the last small red orb drops. Now it's time to head to the lab. After placing all of the red orbs on the prison map, we learn it was actually a key to a hidden cryo chamber. And while we don't know who or what is in there yet, we will soon find out. At this point, we enter the boss fight and are introduced to a much larger Brutus. This is a standard three sequence boss fight where our job is to kill everything on the mound as we are constantly getting attacked by multiple Brutuses, zombies, and hellhounds. Having the magma gap makes this whole boss fight incredibly easy, but to my surprise, it can be kind of hard if you only use regular guns or even the ray gun. After clearing the playing field, another Brutus will spawn in, gas the area, which requires us to shoot three red orbs hovering above him as well as shield blasting the machine in the center of the arena. After completing a few times, Richtofen will enter the machine and start ridding himself of his blood. Giant Brutus enters the arena and then we learn who was in that hidden cryo chamber. A third, Richtofen. Making his way from the lab to the boss arena, Richtofen destroys Brutus in one shot with a powerful crystal from the fire staff from Origins. And then the ending cutscene begins to play. This is hands down one of the best ending cinematics we have ever received in Call of Duty Zombies history. It was beautifully put together by Treyarch, Craig Houston, the lead writer, and voice acted to perfection by Nolan North, who plays Richtofen. Every single person in the community was shaken to their core by not only what happened to Richtofen and to Premise, but by the fact that Treyarch had thrown everything they had into the cinematic and it showed. And this is why it remains one of the most iconic moments in Call of Duty Zombies. I think one of the more underrated aspects of Blood of the Dead would have to be its gameplay loop. If you're a Mob of the Dead purist, then I would presume that the gameplay experience wouldn't be for you as it doesn't feel like Mob at all. Not only are Black Ops 4's mechanics wildly different compared to its predecessor, but the way you interact with the space in general is not nearly as threatening until you are past round 30 and onward. With the ability to select any perk we desire upon entry, the gameplay style can be whatever we want it to be simply based on our loadout. And while I do prefer the general perk system and am not a huge fan of loadouts and zombies, I do think that there is a lot of added variety in this particular instance. Taking in perks like Electric Burst, Winter's Whale, Stone Cold Stronghold, or Victorious Tortoise can turn anybody into a camping madman, or just use the Stamina Up modifier for max sprint and train until your heart's content. Between the new areas in the map, perk variety and wonder weapon variants, the options to mix and match to find the perfect playstyle is unparalleled to maps both old and new. This wouldn't be a zombies map without a wonder weapon, and in this case, Blood of the Dead wouldn't be complete without a Blundergat. And this time, we have three of them, the standard Blundergat, the Acid Gat, and the Magma Gat. Thankfully, Treyarch kept how you acquire the Blundergat the exact same as from Mob of the Dead. This also goes for the Acid Gat, which keeping these steps the same was definitely the right call as it provides a level of familiarity and nostalgia while playing the map. But the star of the show has to go to the Magma Gat, not only for its power, but for the quest to build it. Once the Blundergat has been picked up, head to the Warden's house to place the weapon inside the fireplace. Kill zombies and collect their souls until three skulls on the mantle are coated in blue flames. Place a piece of your soul into the fireplace and collect the weapon. But we're not done yet. Running at full speed, we have to keep the flame alive on the gun by taking it back to spawn, dipping it in blue flamed barrels, lighting our path back to the new industries building. Once we arrive, we forge the weapon inside of the machine with the assistance of old prisoner's spirits and are rewarded with one of the best wonder weapons in the game. Not too dissimilar from the acid Gat, it shoots out an elemental effect that attracts the zombies and then disintegrates them. But the decoy effect is much stronger on the Magma Gat while also giving you two shots when it's pack-a-punched. This weapon helps with so many aspects of the map, it really doesn't matter what you're trying to do, the Magma Gat will always be there to protect you. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same thing about the Hell's Retriever, as this weapon is such a downgrade from the original that it might as well not even be in the game. Getting the Retriever, like the Blundergat, is basically the exact same 
famous mob of the dead other than the part where you grab it underground during a fast travel event which is cool as hell by the way no pun intended the hell's redeemer on the other hand is a much better weapon to use the actual acquiring process is a bit unintuitive as we have to stand near the catwalk entrance training zombies and killing them with the hell's retriever and if done correctly a light blue glow trailing the weapon will appear although it's not very noticeable after enough zombies have been killed an audio cue will play meaning it's now time to wander around looking for a blue hellhound painted on the wall and throw the retriever inside at the next dog round pull out the shield and hunt the grounds for blue paw prints then locate the hellhound's spirit shield blast him and then fast travel again to grab the upgraded hell's redeemer this process it's just okay it's nice to have another quest to go on and the redeemer is actually pretty fun to use for a little bit this weapon tends to get a lot of flack from mob of the dead fans as they think the hell's redeemer back then was some like super op weapon but i have to say that this isn't exactly true while blood's hell's redeemer isn't exactly the golden spork knife it can certainly get the job done oh yeah the golden spork knife The Golden Spork Knife is hands down my favorite side quest wonder weapon in COD Zombies history. I think it is such a fun weapon to use as it's just so OP. I also think it's a great time to build as it's pretty much its own main quest. After grabbing the spork from the docks, place it in the bathtub in the infirmary and get kills on the roof with the wonder weapon. Once the tub is full, drain it, destroy the water tower outside of the map and collect the Golden Spork. Then head to the new industries building, get a bunch of kills near or around the tub full of blood and and then give the golden spork to the skeleton hand in the tub. Then we make our way around the island collecting three rocks outside of the map using the Hell's Redeemer. After all three rocks are collected, place them down at the three traps and get kills at each one of them, turning the rocks into gems. Once that's completed, fast travel to the new industries building and before the grate closes, grab the golden stone from the tunnel. Make your way to the machine press, insert all the gems and golden stone to craft the golden scalpel. But we're not done. Head back to the tub of blood and hand the skeleton the golden shank. Make your way to the catwalk to kill Brutus with melee only by that center pillar. Head back to the tub where the skeleton will have used the shank and the spork, providing us with the ultimate melee weapon, the golden spork knife. This quest is so much fun to do and the weapon is truly OP and will kill anything and everything with one shot forever. The main issue with this Easter egg is that Treyarch added it in later after all the main issues occurred with the launch of Blood of the Dead. Normally, I would say that adding in Easter Easter eggs after the map has launched is a good thing as it brings something new to the table after we have discovered all the map has to offer. But since Blood of the Dead was garnering a reputation for being too difficult and too tedious, no one wanted to give it a shot and nobody gave a damn. And what's frustrating about this now is that Blood of the Dead is one of the most feature rich maps of Black Ops 4. Not only does it have a main Easter egg, but it has three Wonder Weapon variants, two Retriever variants, and four melee variants for the Spork. All with their own unique quests or building mechanics associated with them. And I can't forget to mention the monkey bomb side quest that we discussed earlier. There is literally so much to do on this map and I don't get how you could ever get bored unless Easter eggs just aren't really your thing. Now, I'm not really the biggest fan of high rounds in Black Ops 4. And with that in mind, I do think Blood of the Dead is one of the more boring maps to even get around 100 on. If you like sitting around by one trap for hours and hours until you see that number 100 roll on your screen, then by all means, do you, but that's just not for me. The main strat is simply to get set up as one normally does, killing zombies along the way however you feel comfortable up until around round 40 or 50. And then you're gonna wanna use the trap in the new industries building as it's not only powerful, but it has a decoy effect built in. There is some skill in picking the correct perks and elixirs for the job. Things like dying with Wish, Victorious Tortoise, and Time Slip will give you extra life, shield protection, faster recharge on specialists, and things like that. It does get a little tricky around the 70s with this strat, as I did die while doing it, but this was my first attempt at doing around 100 with this method, and with enough practice, I think I could likely achieve it. Ultimately, Blood is a quest-driven map, and most other side modes or high rounds don't play nearly as well as that main easter egg. 
So how do side modes feel in this map? Well, side modes have always been an issue in zombies and Treyarch has never quite figured out which ones work with the mode up until Onslaught and Outbreak were developed for Black Ops Cold War. Black Ops 4 has Rush and Gauntlets, which aren't bad by any means, but they are a bit lackluster as these modes don't quite fit on every single map, especially Rush. Rush is a weird game mode. The goal of it is to get as high of a score as possible without taking damage and staying in a sectioned off location determined at random. Spending points isn't the objective here, so weapons and pack-a-punch are all free and the map will slowly open up the longer you survive. The problem here is that blood is just too big, meaning that opening up the map and getting set up takes quite a long time. Not to mention that spawn, the main prison, and the docks are so far away from one another, it's really hard to access things like crafting tables, perks, and other features if you continually get bad luck with the RNG defense lockdown areas. The main strat in Rush is to abuse Victorious Tortoise and keep the shield out at all times while using the Viper and Dragon specialist from the Chaos Story since it has a decoy effect built in which will keep the zombies away from you. And as we all know, the shield in Blood of the Dead is essentially useless since it has no bullets and you can't use the Viper and Dragon specialist inside of the Aether storyline. While you're playing in all of these negative are mixing together, it feels very apparent. And instead of wanting to keep pushing forward, you really just end up running out of steam and wanting to quit. Luckily, there is another side mode that we can try. Gauntlets are a 30 round challenge match where during each round, you have to complete a unique challenge before progressing onto the next round or you will fail. And honestly, guys, the gauntlet on blood was surprisingly quite fun. It took me about three tries with only irregular elixirs to complete. What is great about gauntlets in general is that when you fail them, you learn what's coming ahead and then can prepare for it, which is why the Helcatraz gauntlet is so good. Not only is it incredibly streamlined, but the challenges that come ahead don't severely deviate you from your progression, which means that you're moving forward at a constant and comfortable pace. To be quite honest, the first 10 rounds are much harder than the last 20, mainly because the player is underpowered. You're also severely restricted in your ability to manipulate the map to your advantage, which makes the silver and gold medal challenges interesting and fun to complete. One of my favorite challenges is points are reset to zero, which happens at round 22. And it seems like such an intimidating prospect, but simply spending all your points before beforehand to become overpowered and then losing a few hundred points isn't really a big deal now is it? Things like this make the Helcatraz Gauntlet such a joy to play. Not to mention it's a break from doing the main quest or a high round run which will give a fresh spin on whatever map you decide to play. I love the zombies community. I really do. We are a very passionate and opinionated bunch, which is why it's very important to now step back, take a breath, and break down how the devs constructed the content in this map. Blood of the Dead certainly had a rocky start with technical issues and the lofty expectations set both by fans and developers. But now that many years have passed, my appreciation for this map has increased tenfold. From the narrative, enemy design, quests, wonder weapons, and all the various modes, there are so many moving parts. And while it took Treyarch too long to make sure that all these things were in working order, things are working now and the experience is truly special. It does have some weak elements like the Hell's Retriever, a couple of bad easter egg steps, and Rush Mode doesn't play perfectly well on it. But no map is perfect and those issues are pretty menial when you look at the bigger picture. I know this might not be the average YouTuber position, but I don't really care because after spending so much time with this map for the last few weeks, I not only have found a new respect for for it, but I can confidently say it's one of the greats. If you've had issues with this map before and haven't played it in a while, I urge you to give it a chance. It's clear that the devs poured their heart and soul into it, and the negative attention that this map receives is incredibly unwarranted. While overarching group consensus can be important, to truly understand how any map fits in the zombies lexicon, it's important to evaluate it honestly with what you like as a player and objectively as a piece of AAA developed content. So go on and give it a shot and make your own opinion, and then come back here and tell me what you think. Until then, be well, and I will see you in the next episode.